Okay, well, hello. Let's uh, start recording and um, welcome to our Zoom discussion with John Royer on the Treaty Prohibiting Nuclear Weapons, which will be coming into force on January 22nd. This is a momentous event and we're delighted to have John here to explain how it came about and how it will be enforced. This event is part of a series sponsored by the Vermont Institute for Community and International Involvement. Vicky with two eyes at the end is a sequel to Vicky with one eye, <laughs> uh, Vermont Institute for Community Involvement, which was the original name of a college without walls that became Burlington College. After the bankruptcy and demise of the college in 2016, some of the staff, primarily Sandy Baird and friends, wanted to bring back opportunities for community discussion with the goal of supporting civil society and municipal democracy in Burlington. So you can see that uh, here it is, just a moment. And um, I will share a screen image with you here. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> there it is. Um, you can see that the added I in Vicky is stands for international involvement. So check out our website, vicky.com, for our track record, events dating back to September 2019. Also coming up, we will be sponsoring the first Burlington mayoral debate on January 21st. So the phoenix is rising. <laughs> um, so I will get rid of that now. Um, before John speaks, I'd like to just draw attention to an event that happened in, um, in 2018, and that is a kind of precursor of, to the treaty that we're talking about today that declares nuclear weapons are illegal. The Plowshare 7, who entered Kings Bay Trident Submarine Base in Georgia on April 4th, 2018, sought to make real the prophet Isaiah's command to beat swords into plowshares. They acted on the ground that these weapons are inhumane and should be considered illegal. One of the plowshares seven, Martha Hennessy from Vermont, whose granddaughter of Dorothy Day, is now in Danbury prison for 10 months mm -hmm. for taking what she calls my nonviolent sacramental action against nuclear weapons. So what I'd like for us to do here, and here's another screenshot, I hope. Wait a minute here. Here it is. Um, and uh, Share screen. Okay. Uh, someday we'll we'll get it all very smooth. There it is. Okay. Um, let's look at the at the weapon system that these folks were were protesting against um, at uh, at in in Georgia. And what is a Trident submarine engineered to do? So this graphic was drawn by Vermonter Jim Geyer in 1983, when the Soviet Union, as you can see, still existed. Some of these numbers may have been changed by requirements of the START Treaty. There, but at, at the moment, there are six Trident submarines at Kings Bay. Each submarine can carry 24 Trident II ballistic missiles. There you see them, 24. Uh, if, God forbid, all of these missiles from one submarine were launched, they will, upon re-entering the atmosphere, each of the 24 missiles could release up to eight warheads, independently targeted re-entry vehicles, they call them. In other words, targeted to this one to hit St. Petersburg, this one to hit Moscow, this one to hit, etc. And... Um, these unleashing 192 nuclear warheads to wipe out dozens of cities off the map. And that's only one 
of the sub of the six submarines. These are the nightmare weapons of the apocalypse. So Martha and her Catholic worker compatriots are now facing prison sentences for bringing attention to this floating potential Holocaust harbored at Kings Bay, Georgia. I am hoping that we and John, John Royer and this movement supporting the treaty will further reveal the military madness that sustains the arms race and that American citizens will agree that we too, our country, the United States should join the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. Pashi always says it. I know. So In German, um, just a few, few words now about John. Um, he is a member of Physicians for Social Responsibility and serves on World Beyond Wars Board of Directors. He was a professor of conflict resolution at St. Michael's College here in the Burlington area. Huh. Determined to bring his commitment to nonviolence into areas of conflict, he recently spent four months last year in South Sudan with the Nonviolent Peace Force. And for the last two months on the streets of Washington, DC, including last Wednesday, <laughs> with members of the DC peace team providing safe space for peaceful protesters and engaging in conversation with Trump activists. So John will talk for about 20, 25 minutes and then we would like you to, if you have questions to put them in the chat. You all know about the chat at the bottom of the screen there. You click on that and you write a little message and Beth will be monitoring that and um, we hope that that will be the way to get a dialogue going. So, all right, please start, John. Thank you all for having me and being willing to talk about a topic that is just seems to be like one more god awful thing to worry about on top of all the other god awful things that are in our <laughs> lives right now. Uh, but I think it's worth doing. Everybody see the slides? Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can make your screen larger, the slide larger and your people smaller by moving the little line between them on the side if things are in the way. So we have this new treaty called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that was adopted in 19, 2017 and about to go into force. So I want to go over what does that mean and why should we care? I mean, obviously we have enough to worry about, right? We've got a virus that's Take, taken over the planet that shows no sign of slowing down despite the vaccine having been out for a full month. Right. Uh, climate disasters everywhere. My daughter in LA tells oh. me the hospitals out there have instructed the EMTs that if they go to a house where somebody's had a cardiac arrest that is no pulse or, or breathing at the time they get there, they're not to bring them to the hospital where they would have a chance at resuscitation that I spent my career doing. That's how tight things are. And now, of course, we have this whole uh, civil strife within the U.S. So where do nuclear weapons come in? Why should we care? Well, Nancy Pelosi reminded us of maybe why should we care? Because we've got a guy who's rather impulsive in his speech and in his orders, firing and hiring people. And he has absolute sole legal authority to launch nuclear weapons, one or all of them, without consulting anyone. She gave us uh, the news that she had talked to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and she felt reassured by that. But the legality of it is the only thing that would stop him is a mutiny. Policy gives him the right to do that. And what is the message to enemies and allies around the world that the only thing that would stop us from attacking is a mutiny against our own president? Very, very uh, much reason to worry. But aside from that, Nuclear weapons, I think most people recognize how dangerous they are to use, but few recognize how dangerous they are to possess. And secondly, this treaty is the best opportunity to eliminate them since the non-proliferation treaty came into force in 1970 that led to such disarmament via the strategic arms reduction treaties that are still in effect until February 5th this year, when for the first time the United States is not just automatically renegotiated or renewed them. Furthermore, we should care because while solutions to the environmental and pandemic crises that we face 
are very complicated, obviously, long-term and very expensive. Whereas solutions to the threat of nuclear annihilation are relatively easy and not just cheap, but because we stop spending money on creating the risk, it pays for itself and can help pay for solutions to these other existential threats we face. Now, just as a review, and I'm sure most folks on this call are familiar with this, but just update ourselves. The total nuclear warheads in the world's arsenals are now between 13 and 14,000, 90% of which are controlled by Russia and the United States. Russia and the United States are also the only countries that have something just under a thousand each on hair trigger alert. That is, they can be launched on warning or launched by a leader within a half an hour or less. And to review the size of these weapons, these four mushroom clouds show at the bottom, the very small one being the Hiroshima, a uh, weapon that destroyed Hiroshima. And the one at the top being the largest that the United States ever tested in the atmosphere, which itself was about one third the size of the Tsar bomb that the Soviet Union tested in the 60s. For most of the history of nuclear arms race, the weapons were in the 100 ki kiloton or the one megaton range, the cloud on the left. And now most of those 13,000 weapons are between the 15 kiloton weapon and the 350 kiloton weapon. Just to remind ourselves of why we should worry about these, of course, if they're used, which is not the biggest issue because I think people recognize this, but it, it's good to remember just how bad it's gonna be, much worse than anything we're facing now. Uh, just to remind us that it's a very personal thing because our beloved senators and governors and mayors have decided that the nuclear weapons delivery system of the F-35, despite what the National Guard tells us, uh, is listed as, as a nuclear weapon delivery system, makes us a target for other planners who have to eliminate nuclear weapons delivery system in the event of a nuclear war, making us a nuclear target. So if we take a 200 kiloton airburst, that is one besides those, between those two small mushrooms and typical of the Soviet submarine arsenal that could be in the North Atlantic right now and be here within 15 to 20 minutes, if they so choose, would create this fireball over the airport that is a several hundred yards across and vaporizes absolutely everything, the small yellow circle. The red circle then is the 20 pounds per square inch blast, which destroys absolutely everything but reinforced bunkers. Everything is gone and destroyed in that area. And if anybody manages to, to, to uh, not get hit by the blast directly, the green is the 500 millirem radiation burst, gamma radiation that kills 90% of the people who are exposed to that. The gray circle then shows the five pounds per square inch over blast pressure from the blast that destroys all unreinforced buildings and injures about 90% of the people who live in that area. You can see that puts us over the hill toward downtown Burlington and way out past Williston and south. And, and then finally, the tan larger circle is the thermal area where the intensity of the heat from the flash is enough to ignite absolutely everything flammable, gasoline tanks and cars, any dry wood, trees, wood houses, and causes immediate third degree burns on exposed skin. And this is a airburst that is a bomb detonated in the atmosphere to do maximum blast damage. If on the other hand, you're trying to eliminate an underground bunker, you do a ground burst, which makes huge amounts of soil and everything underground radioactive and puts that into the mushroom cloud, causing these large plumes of radioactivity that creates uh, much disease and death in the weeks and years to follow. And this is that same 200 kiloton burst uh, and, it's, and it's a radiation cloud over the next week or so. Uh, and the direction of course is determined by wind that day. And then the other element that we often forget besides those first three uh, problems with nuclear weapons is the firestorms it causes from all the things that coalesce and burn. This is actually what destroyed most of Hiroshima. And the problem with that much burning is in dense areas where there's a lot of combustible material, it puts enormous amount of soot, far more than the mushroom clouds into the atmosphere. 
And climate scientists at Rutgers, who've been studying the effects of climate change for many, many years and trying to predict it, says that in, in a war between India and Pakistan, which are the only two nuclear powers to be at war with each other intermittently in the last few years, if they used half of their arsenals, which is now up to about 150 Hiroshima, Hiroshima sized nuclear weapons, the amount of soot from all the cities burning in those areas, forgetting about the 10 or 20 million people that would be killed outright, would put enough soot in the atmosphere to drop the temperature in the Northern hemisphere about a degree and a quarter. And, and that has enormous effects as can be seen in this next screen. Uh, can you all see my faces there? I'm trying to... Okay, so a temperature drop of one degree would create enough problem growing food in the Northern hemisphere and eventually in the Southern hemisphere that the famine caused by that would probably leave the 2 billion of the world's poorest people to die from starvation alone. And that's a limited war between India and Pakistan that would not have immediate effects on us until the weeks and months later. A war fought between those high alert nuclear weapons. Uh, if a mistake happens and they just launch those weapons and then they realize, oops, that was a mistake, we won't launch any more. The climatologists tell us would drop at least four degrees centigrade in the, in the atmospheric conditions, which would create unbelievable amounts of, of temperature change and, and starvation for the rest of us. And then of course, if all of the, the weapons that are available are used, we're talking about temperatures of eight degrees, which would create in a couple of weeks, what 10,000 years of the ice age, ice age created, basically ending civilization. And this is on top of all the billions of people killed directly by the, the effects of the fires, blast and radiation. So given that good news, why do we have these things? Well, somehow buried in our, in our teaching and our, in our learning over uh, from the time we were young is that this is deterrence. It keeps the bad guys away. It's mutually assured destruction, which is, is much more like mutually assured suicide at this point. But those who protest them are thought to be safe from attack. No all out wars after all have occurred between powers since the advent of nuclear weapons and none have been used as an act of war in the last 75 years. And those to some people seem like pretty ironclad arguments. But you could say a lot about whether that's true or not. Think for example, that did nuclear weapons save us from uh, the attacks at 9-11? Did nuclear weapons allow us to easily beat Vietnam in a war or allow the Soviets to beat the Afghans in their own country? Did they stop nuclear armed Britain from suffering an attack on the Falkland Islands by Argentina. So in my mind, it's rather limited thinking that believes these things. But more to the point, you know, as a doctor, when I tried to talk people out of an unhealthy habit, say smoking, you know, quite often I'd get the thing back. Well, my granddad smoked until he was 90 and he never got cancer. And so it's a psychological phenomenon in human beings and other species too, that the longer things do well, the more we come to believe that they will continue to do well and the greater sense of well-being we have. And that's the way I look at us with nuclear weapons. Think of it like a turkey being hatched from a nice egg and its human caretakers carefully place it in an incubator with the proper heat, and when it hatches, they feed, uh, they feed it well, and they keep it warm, and they give it whatever they need to give it to grow well. And that turkey, no doubt, has a lot of faith in its human caretakers. Until a certain day, like Thanksgiving. And all of a sudden, everything they believed is just not true. And they think, how could we have ever believed that? And I think that's the way it's going to be with nuclear weapons, unless we take action soon. So what are the risks of deterrent? They fit in three main categories. First of all, any current leader can use these weapons to win a war or to make a point. Then there's the problem of nuclear terrorism. We know for a fact that terrorist groups are forever trying to obtain materials or the weapons themselves. And then there are accidents. And we know a lot about these. In Trump's early years, we had he and Kim Jong-un, both with nuclear weapons, 
saying all kinds of nasty things about each other. And if those weapons had gone off, like they almost uh, thought they did in Hawaii, nobody was terribly surprised. And here's Pakistan threatening the world because of being angry at what India is doing in Kashmir. These are two nuclear armed powers that two soldiers shoot at one another. Then there's the problem of ter terrorism. So the US has nuclear weapons in five NATO countries. The one of interest to terrorists would be at Encirlik Air, Air Base in southeastern Turkey, where I've been told in, in uh, 2007, 2016 or 15, the, there was a, a coup against the uh, Erdogan, the prime minister of Turkey. And one of the leaders of that was the commander of the base where these nuclear weapons are stored at Encirlik. And he cut off all power to the base. And that led for an opportunity that, uh, that created some chaos where those nuclear weapons were put at risk. At the time, ISIS was at the height of its geographical power and was less than 100 miles from those nuclear weapons. We're taking, that's another chance we're taking. And then if you ever read the records about how many kilograms of fissile material are unaccounted for from the former Soviet Union and even from us and how many nuclear weapons we've lost here and there uh, becomes something to be concerned about. There have been six documented times where either Russian or US forces came to believe that they were under attack and only at the last moment pulled out from unleashing total Armageddon. And this is separate from the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was probably our closest ever to nuclear war. Stanislav Petrov, you know, who died last year and just put out a wonderful movie, I hope you'll see it if you haven't so far, called The Man Who Saved the World, helped design the system that he was running. Uh, and he, he saw this movie show so well and it actually interviews him of what he remembers is seeing this incoming signals from the computer saying we were under attack. First there was one, then another and another. And in a very difficult decision, he simply refused to believe it, um, but he just couldn't bring himself to to launch those weapons. And that's just one of many. And then there are broken arrows defined by the US Defense Department as nuclear weapons that have been launched, at least their carriers have been launched accidentally, uh, lost or unaccounted for. There've been 32 of those. I, I'll spare you the movie about this at the time. And so General Lee Butler, former commander of all US nuclear forces, both submarines and ICBMs and aircraft, the Air Force uh, General, in his memoir said, the world escaped nuclear holocaust by some combination of skill, luck, and divine intervention. And he finally decided it was mostly divine intervention. And when I studied this stuff before his time back in the eighties, that's the same conclusion I came to it, that if there's any proof of the existence of God, it's the fact that we're still here when we've tried to do everything we can to do ourselves away. But actually it was more than just divine intervention. It was people taking action. You know, some of us here, I wasn't the only one here that was in, in uh, Central Park in 1982, when a million people gathered to say it's end, time to end the arms race. And that followed many, many years of work with the nuclear freeze campaign and nuclear free zones that were highly participated in by towns in Vermont. People like Helen Caldicott and H. Jack Geiger, who just died this week, and the others from Physicians for Social Responsibility that I met when I was a young doctor who convinced people to change in particular, Ronald Reagan, who got my interest by saying we were going to win a war with the Soviet Union when he became president and had plans to do that. And a mere three years later, through, I think, tremendous activist efforts, agreed that a nuclear war should, cannot be won and must never be fought. And while he didn't do anything to reduce nuclear weapons himself, he did finally, uh, after a number of years, sign the Interman Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. And I just wanted to show you this map and the effects of treaty, since that's what we're talking about tonight and how critical that is. Uh, you can see on this graph, the, the blue lines are US numbers of weapons and the red are the Soviets and how they played a game of catch up and eventually had to prove themselves superior. And the strategic arms limitation talks that, that came before Reagan really accomplished almost nothing. And even the non-proliferation treaty of uh, 1968, 1970, you can see, put only the tiniest dent in this. And it wasn't until the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that things really started to happen. 
And that's one of the treaties that Trump pulled us out of, that thing that had saved us so many billions of dollars in unnecessary weapons and reduced the risk for all of Europe. And then the treaties that also made a huge difference are the strategic arms reduction treaties. And these are what continued today, the START II, and now what they call the new START in 2010, which you can see, but the rate of decrease in nuclear weapons has slowed dramatically. And as of February 5th, none of these treaties are any longer in place. And there's no reason in the world don't think these, to think that these weapons are not gonna be uh, increased in number, though they may be decreased in size because that makes them more usable in some planners' minds. So treaties have huge impacts. And so our decision is already being made for us, starting with Obama, despite what he said in Prague about wanting to get rid of nuclear weapons, he said, well, it's not gonna happen in my lifetime. And he let the Congress begin to allot money for modernization of nuclear weapons over the next 10 and actually 30 years to the tune of $1.24 trillion, which of course, since this Congressional Budget Office report in 2015 or so, is now gone to 1.6 or 1.7 trillion dollars. Very similar in price to the cost of the F-35 fighter jet, actually. And the leaders, of course, of all the nuclear nations, uh, nuclear armed nations, uh, don't like this ban treaty at all. They want to bomb the ban. So the choice is really ours. We can either ban the bomb with the prohibition treaty, and eliminate these things for good, or we can agree with the way things are, heck with the ban, and face our new nuclear arms race, and I think absolutely inevitable catastrophe. So what does the Treaty to, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons do? It actually bans everything to do with nuclear weapons. If you think about it, nuclear weapons have really been technically illegal under humanitarian and every law of war because they're indiscriminate in how they slaughter civilians and non-combatants, and they're totally disproportional to any military objectives. So technically, if it was a true court of law, they would be banned on the basis of current law. But this treaty bans everything about them, development, testing, production, possession, transfer, or the threatened use of it, and essentially any kind of support to nuclear weapons. And that's what makes all the difference. It was adopted and I was there for that in 2017 by the majority of nations in the world. So far it's been signed by 86 nations who all expected eventually to ratify it, ratified by 51 nations, which has allowed it to enter into force this Friday. Now, what is the value of it entering in, into force? So you hear criticisms of, well, what good is it gonna do? It's not signed by any nuclear nation and they're the only ones that matter. It won't eliminate a singular nuclear weapon by itself, which is true. And then the, the State Department uh, statements that I've heard basically say it doesn't account for international security concerns, but I can't make any sense when they say it, what that actually means that somehow it's just a belief that in deterrence, we have more security than we do, do without it. And I just don't see any evidence for that. That's a criticism. And then it, that it's not verifiable. And we can talk about that too, if anybody has questions. How do you be sure that you get, you get rid of all yours and the other guy doesn't? Well, the fact that it's illegal to even support these is, and, and it's the effect it will have without not everybody signing it. We have lots of evidence for that. So biological weapons and chemical weapons, which were signed by the big powers, uh, in 1972 and 1993, of course, have made those weapons of mass destruction unacceptable. So that when Syria may or may not have actually used them, but when even threatened to use them, the whole world went nuts and said, no way, no way, you can't do that. And so they've been used very, very little since then. Landmines were banned in 1997 and cluster bombs were banned in 2008. The US hasn't signed either of those. And yet, except for North Korea, we pretty much observe them. We don't spread landmines and sell them all over the world anymore. Cluster bombs have a very interesting story in the US because we don't want part of that treaty. And yet the only munitions, cluster munitions manufacturing plant in the US, which was run by Textron, just shut down uh, a few years after this, saying that people aren't interested in them anymore. So not everybody has to sign these things to have a huge, huge effect. So what it will do for the nuclear powers, instead of nuclear weapons now being a, a 
badge of honor and a, and a source of pride, which they still are for many people in the world, they're now illegal, they're prohibited, or they have a stigma. And states possessing them over time, we believe, will become rogue states rather than powers to emulate. And what is, has been immoral all along is now unequivocally illegal under international law. And it's a very good reason when we push our, our Congress people to stop voting money for these things to say, look, this is one more really good reason not to spend money on things we can never use and could do us in. So what can we do? Well, Robin brought up this brave group of seven. You know, if the nuclear weapons go off, there's not many people who think nothing of these people, know nothing of these people now, could care less about them, will see them as anything but heroes. As one of them, and more than one of them said in their statements as they were being sentenced to, to jail, speaking out against these weapons in their submarines at Kings Bay, they said, you know, ultimately, what am I going to say to my children and my grandchildren? Or what are they going to think when things go wrong? And they say, well, mom, what did you do to try to stop that? And they have the answer. We did everything we possibly could. But I don't think we have to go to jail necessarily. I think there's a place for that. And if we all did it, they'd pack the jails and nobody would have to go to jail if, if really just a few thousand of us did it, did it. But that takes a lot of guts and a lot of risk that most of us aren't willing to take. So what else can we do? Well, the immediate things that are really likely to succeed are to push President-elect Biden to renew the New START Treaty, which expires in just a couple of weeks. When that goes away, there's no limits on a new nuclear arms race. So to renewing that treaty, and he has expressed a willingness to do that. The other thing that could be done immediately that he has expressed a willingness to do is rejoin what they call the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is some people call the Iran nuclear deal, which all international inspector, inspectors who were inside Iran said was working. Iran destroyed most of its centrifuges that concentrate fissile material, and we're doing everything in compliance with the deal, and Trump withdrew from it. And now Iran has started to enrich uranium to a much higher percentage again, and unless are attacked viciously in a war with unbelievable suffering, or get back into this agreement, they within a year or two or three could have a nuclear weapon. And of course, always, because this is all money driven, push for reduction in nuclear spending, even if you don't believe in reductions in all military spending. Our federal representatives, our three fairly liberal folks in, in Congress, uh, need to support Biden in this, which I think they all have the two things I mentioned. Um, they're much less enthusiastic about decreasing military spending. And then the, the best single bill that will have to be a new bill, I guess, in 2020, because it's a new session of Congress, is, is the one introduced for the last 10 years by Eleanor Holm Norton, the non-voting member of Congress in, from DC, called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. And you'll see a version of this in 220. She went from, for the first five years, having no co-sponsors, not a single other congressperson, to having about eight last year. And we can push our three people who have never voted for it to, to sign on to that. And then the international campaign to, to eliminate, abolish nuclear weapons, supported by its US version of the nuclear ban dot, uh, or uh, nuclear ban, uh, tries to get as many politicians at all levels, from city council to federal, to even though they're not in a position to vote on the treaty, to say they would vote for it if they ever have the opportunity. So that's called the Parliamentarian Pledge and, and has become really important in Europe where the countries are refusing to, the leaders are refusing to sign but higher and higher percentages of the parliaments are signing on and that'll eventually change that. Who, who joins the treaty in Europe? Uh, just a background on this nuclear weapons evolution economic conversion. I like it because it does everything. Eliminates a nuclear weapon and demands that the money spent on them go into green energy conversion and other things to help people. It, it's a very simple bill that's less than two pages summarized here. It says the United States government should provide leadership in signing and ratifying this, this treaty, or if they don't like that, when any other international agreement that provides for the elimination of all nuclear weapons in every country. Nobody here is talking about unilateral disarmament, uh, but under strict, strict international control. 
and redirect resources used for nuclear weapons for these better things and a peaceful economy, including addressing human and infrastructure needs. And then finally, be a leader in, in getting all other countries to join their commitments. Can you imagine if the US said, we're gonna go with this thing, the influence they could have in, in uh, getting people to go along with it. Just as some evidence of that, uh, just before this treaty was finally ratified by enough nations to put it into force in December, the US State Department sent a letter to all the countries that had signed it asking them to rescind their signature, saying that this was gonna disturb the international order and please withdraw from the treaty. Not a single one did. Finally, within Vermont, what can the Vermont legislature do? Well, if you remember back in 2019, I think the Senate passed SR5, which is saying it was a resolution against having any nuclear weapons delivery systems in Vermont. And then some people, I think from our federal office, uh, lobbied against the House version of that and it was shot down. I testified before the legislature last year to try to revive it, but the, the pandemic was just starting and they put everything else aside since then. The other thing that we've done is in the cities of South Burlington, Burlington, Winooski, we passed back from the brink resolutions that I'll tell you a little bit about here. So if the US is not ready to actually sign the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, there are things we can do immediately that will at least bring us back from the brink of, of the, the danger of, of nuclear war. And that is these one and two almost together now, and, and Trump has given us all the more reason to do that. We can end the sole unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack. But if we just renounce the option of using nuclear weapons first, it kind of accomplishes both things. Um, right now, the only nations that, I guess China is the only one of the nuclear powers that said we will never use the, the weapons first but US is the only one that regularly puts them on the table under the, the sentence, all options are on the table. We could stop that, which if you were anybody else in the world would probably make you feel safer rather than less safe. Then finally taking the, the weapons off hair trigger alert and canceling all the expenditures on replacing these new weapons with modernized or enhanced or more usable weapons. And then finally pursue an agreement to get rid of them all. So these are the five back from the brink things. And these three townships so far have signed these in a way similar to towns that signed the nuclear freeze resolutions back in the 1980s that eventually led to such tremendous reductions. So anybody that's in the town uh, in Vermont that wants to do that, it's pretty, pretty easy. We had no trouble, very little resistance for these very common sense things. And now's a good time to do it if you can get people's attention away from all the other problems. Uh, meanwhile, as individuals, I would say just get on the list serv of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we are starting a new movement in, uh, with the help of a group called Code Pink, who has a lot of expertise in, in uh, divestment. See, these, these companies are going to be very susceptible to public pressure now. And unlike governments, who ultimately answer to corporations and, and the whims of their politicians and have guns to stop us from doing things, corporations are exquisitely sensitive to their bottom lines. And when people talk about divesting from, from those companies in their pension funds and in their personal finances and so forth, they really perk up and, and pay attention. Letters to the editor, I had one come out about this that I think Robin sent out the invitation to this. Uh, that, I, that still is very relevant from September. And I just submitted another one to Vermont Digger. Uh, just let people know about this. This is just too easy not to do. So I'd be happy to take uh, questions about this. Oh, let me show you one more slide. Um, and that is, this is how many, this is the 26 worldwide major nuclear weapons contractors. And almost none of them make just nuclear weapons. They have business everywhere. And because they have businesses in countries that have signed the treaty, they're now gonna be subject to questions from those countries about their involvement with nuclear weapons. And that's gonna create new conversations that have never happened before. And these are, this Don't Bank on the Bomb, again, is a program of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which led to this treaty, which actually created this treaty. 
And these are all major financiers and investment companies around the world who have divested from nuclear weapons. So this is no pie in the sky stuff. This is really, really doable. So thank you. Thank happy, you. Happy to take questions. We have one, two questions in the chat. Um, Hideko, are you there now? Can you, if you wanted to ask your question. Uh, you said Hideko. Yes, I'm here. Yes, great. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and ask the question for everyone in the chat and then John can respond? Uh, well, uh, one of the um, reasons that the speakers addressed included deterrence effect. And I thought, well, that is fine among sovereign nations, but now it isn't that difficult, I, I understand it, making an atomic bomb. And some rogue band of individuals can make it to use it to insist on their rightful cause, quote unquote. Uh, we're not uh, protected from that. I, I think that uh, the doctor's point in sh uh, the, the significant uh, gain would be to make it very uh, shameful, actually, to be associated with this illegal uh, weapons productions and, and considering the use of it against uh, humanity. Uh, uh, I, I take it, and then I, I must really uh, say that it, I, I, I'm very grateful for uh, this happening because it was very difficult for the last 75 years, no matter where it was, we didn't have a good listening ears. Now we do. Oh, excuse me. We, when I speak of it myself and others, uh, survivors of the nuclear bomb. You're a survivor, Hideko. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you. I, 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 if it were not for Physicians for Social Responsibility, I would not open myself to share anything because I was determined to leave it alone because I had to spend my life denying that I was so affected and protecting myself, disclosing the uh, very deep personal grief. But uh, the, the I, I was at the University of Chicago hospitals and the another institution uh, there the group of radiologists really were interested for their understanding how I could have survived it and really wanted information in their monthly meeting. And just on the academic reason, I shared the information. And, and from there, <laughs> I had to accompany them. They said, you know, you, you would really help us if you could come with us. And it was a year of nuclear freeze and they were doing a fantastic work. And I was so moved by their enthusiasm and compassion and dedication. And I, I now, even though these were very difficult times and, and difficult tasks I, I, I had to carry out, I thank you for your persuading me that there was a place for survivors to share their testimonies. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to just add that Hideko did a wonderful webinar with uh, us, Disarm, Wolf Disarm. Uh, it was at uh, uh, Nagasaki Day, I believe, with yes. photographs from her childhood. And you can go to Wolf disarm and see uh, the link because we we taped that. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, we we're we're trying to figure out in a sense what to do here in Burlington on the twenty second, and uh, it's um, two days after the inauguration, um, and uh, so. Uh, 
emotions may still be high, I don't know, but um, I've looked at that list of 26 organizations and, and compared it here in Burlington and we, we don't have any directly, but we do have Pratt and Whitney. So I actually emailed Susie Snyder, who's the head of uh, Don't Bank on the Bomb, and I said, well, Pratt and Whitney, I think, is associated with uh, nuclear issues. And she said, well, Pratt and Whitney is a subsidiary to United Technologies, which is subsidiary to Raytheon. <laughs> um, I mean, this is the games they play. Uh, and there is a, a decent um, uh, factory or office up there near the airport. I think it's mainly associated with making the engines for the F-35 in Virgins. Has anyone here researched that? That's what, uh, there is a factory that makes engineer, makes engines for the F-35. Would that be a, a proper um, destination for a, a car uh, caravan on the 22nd? And uh, I, I know some of you on this call have looked at the nuclear ban site where they suggest going to a nuclear company and um, wearing, wearing uh, plastic garb and calling yourself um, a, um, a, uh, a code, uh, a code, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, you know, as if you're coming to check out whether they're Inspector. actually abiding. Pardon? Compliance Inspector. is treaty compliance unit. Yes. Yes, and uh, so they did that down in Northampton, and uh, you know, it's a it's sort of a media event, um, and you have to we would have to call Pratt and Whitney and say we are coming, and then call the call the um, media as well. So that is um, in, in process and anyone who wants to take part or has other ideas of what to do on that day, uh, please let me know. We want to uh, let more people know. I mean, look at us here. We're mainly older people who actually remember back when Helen Caldicott came and talked about many of the things that John has just talked about, but we need to get the younger generation involved and we need at least for them to know by doing, taking some action. So any thoughts on that score? If I could just clarify, uh, and I see there's a question about the F-35, uh, going after Pratt and Whitney wouldn't be directly relevant to this to this particular treaty because uh, the, the F-35, which is a separate topic in itself and an equally costly program over the next 30 years, is, is a dual use aircraft. You know, Right now, nobody's saying that the F-35 is ready to carry a nuclear weapon, although it could be any day. Uh, but it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're delivering nuclear weapons. Um, did you, isn't there a general dynamics uh, facility somewhere in Williston yes. or something? Yes, and that's very involved with uh, the Gatling gun. They used to occupy the whole building down on Pine Street uh, where they manufactured the gun, but that's been moved elsewhere. But the, the residue of that, they have some offices. So there again, it's not a nuclear, um, it, it's not a nuclear office. Uh, or doesn't doesn't make nuclear materials, but I mean that would be a possibility, nevertheless. But I believe General Dynamics is involved in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. I'm not sure Pratt and Whitney is specifically the manufacturer of those weapons, so they wouldn't have to be doing that here to call them accountable for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's some other questions on the chat. Uh, Sally is asking, did you did I just wanted, I guess you wanted to clarify, does the, do the F-35s also cost $1.24 trillion? If you look at the lifetime cost of the airplane over the next 30 years, it's remarkable to me how similar the costs are. They're, uh, 
the 30 year to 50 year life of the F-35 and the next 30 years of nuclear weapon spending are in the trillion now in the trillion and a half dollar range. And it, magically that always goes up with time, uh, right? But those are two weapon systems that I just don't see any use for uh, in the world at all. Even if you're the, a believer in the strong military defense, these are, neither of these are defensive weapons of any kind. Nuclear weapons certainly can't protect you from anything. And F-35 is, is not even the best jet to shoot down an incoming bomber with a nuclear weapon on it. The, the older planes do that equally well. The F-35 we're paying so much for because it has stealth capability to penetrate into some other country and bomb their country, which is not a defensive move in any sense of the word. It's just interesting. And, and to translate that into Vermont terms, I haven't looked at the latest figures for the F-35 per year, but nuclear weapons, uh, the, the amount we're spending each year amounts to about $125 million a year of Vermont tax dollars going into all the aspects of nuclear weapons. Wow. That's not a small piece of change. Not in Vermont. Um, Jane is asking, uh, well, first let me say, it's not a big group. So if anybody wants to unmute yourself and ask a question, I don't think chaos will reign. But for now, I'll just add, um, I'll just put Jane's out there, which is, she's curious how the American public feels about nuclear weapons and Trump's action these days. Have there been any polls recently? I haven't seen a poll on Trump uh, particularly. It was Nancy Pelosi that brought that to, to the news recently. But there was kind of a discouraging poll, which goes against almost all prior polls uh, out of Harvard, and it was a small sample. I looked at it as no more than five or 600 people, but 53% of the people in this most recent poll said that we need to spend more money on nuclear weapons. But that is in contrast to everything that's been going on for, for most years. Uh, when you look back, most Americans wanna see nuclear weapons reduced or eliminated. I mean, if you just ask people what their future wants to be, almost all have said that. So I don't know what was going on with that particular poll but it's, it's, it is a little bit worrisome. And I think it reflects the fact that we have forgotten what we learned in World War II, that war needs to go. Uh, but because we've all been raised with the belief that World War II was some kind of heroic event that the US saved the world from evil, which isn't really true in the historical record, uh, we've come to think of war well as maybe a good thing and, and any weapon that we can win a war with, and oh, nuclear weapons, the best weapons of all is this kind of mythical thinking that, that, that permeates, permeates us. And, and the sheer lack of education, just like kids really don't know how the system works. I understand civics classes aren't universal anymore. People don't even know what the vote means. They certainly don't know what, what nuclear weapons can do. Uh, PSR had a little video contest uh, and the winner was a four minute video where they interviewed groups of young people and asked them how many nuclear weapons there were. Nobody got it right. They were off by a handful to many, uh, almost everybody underestimated how many there were. So education is just a huge part of this. You know, we, we brought some Hibakusha to, to the Burlington schools and reached about 1500 kids two years ago. Uh, but my follow-up calls to the schools, let's continue some education about this uh, fell on deaf ears. So any ideas are more than appreciated. Yeah, Beth, let, let me say something. And that is that, um... On the call here is Cheryl Spencer, who is uh, active in Wilf Disarm and has been compiling some resource guides for, um, for uh, January 22nd. And uh, why don't you say something about them? It's, it's compiling all the events that are happening around the country. And we haven't put anything in yet because we don't know, we haven't made anything happen, but so many communities are. Let us know what you found, Cheryl. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm sitting here in uh, Palo Alto, California, and I work with Robin on the Disarm Committee of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And um, I think we have like 18 branches of WILF we have about 40 branches, but 18 of them are actually going to have in-person demonstrations on, on Friday the 22nd on street corners. Uh, these are political protests, and therefore, even though 
California is completely locked down at the moment. We're not supposed to gather with other people at all, but political protests are allowed. So uh, we are, this is a kind of an educate the public, bring attention to the fact that this treaty, which makes nuclear weapons illegal in 51 countries, and of course we know there's going to be more, um, bring that to the attention of the passing public. And then the ICANW.org has a map of uh, all the events that they've been told about. And I just saw an email that there are 87 events they've got on their map, including ones in Australia, in New Zealand, in Germany. Most of them are in, are in the US. And um, at the same, so those are in person, you know, we're always outdoors, always with masks, etc. cetera. And, uh, but there are a lot of webinars that are going to be happening, organized by other organizations like uh, Plowshares and uh, PSR in, in Oregon is, is having a, a webinar and Hideko is actually going to be one of their speakers and um, Global Zero. So in my resource guides, I spent a lot of time finding all these webinars and events and then ICANW just yesterday announced that they are going to be live streaming. They say only for 90 minutes. Um, it will start at noon, uh, no, start at 3 p.m. your time. Uh -huh. And they will be having, uh, they're kind of going to be following the countries where the, um, as, as it comes into effect in its time zone. Oh, really? And they're going to have speakers and um, music and rather like the live streaming that happened on Hiroshima Day last year, where we had many organizations, we submitted, you know, uh, short videos and, and we had panel discussions and I, mm -hmm. hopefully some of you saw those. Yeah. So, um, so you, if you go to ICANW.org and then look at their website, uh, you will find, um, the notice about that live streaming mm -hmm. on your computer. I mean, and there's some uh, big countries that have ratified the treaty. Now to ratify the treaty is a big step. It means their parliament has mulled over this thing. And what does it actually mean to not allow possession or transportation or boats to come Systems. in with radioactive material? They're pondering this and and they, you know, Mexico decided to, uh, Austria, maybe someone knows some of the others, um, yes. bigger cities that are Inter on the list. Countries, right. Interestingly enough, the, the Vatican was about the first one to ratify it. It doesn't take very much for the Vatican to ratify anything. <laughs> I think the Pope has to say so. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> uh, but if you look at the countries by population, like a quarter of the world's population are actually represented, I think it's a quarter, in, in the 50 countries, because you've got Bangladesh, you've got Indonesia, uh -huh. um, and, and a few other places that have got a lot of people who live there. So <laughs> some of them are small states, they are islands in the middle of the Pacific that you've never heard of, but they are sovereign nations. And they have letting the world know you're not, we don't want, you know, your nuclear weapons. The other thing you're supposed to do in the treaty is assist other people who've suffered from nuclear weapons. Um, mm -hmm. The Marshall Islands, for example, was where uh, the US detonated, let me see, tens of bombs in the 1950s, 60s, and they're still suffering from, from the radiation left over. Um, so, it's, it's actually relatively short. Uh, it's only 10 pages, the, the treaty, and it has 20 articles. And so you can find it again through ICANW.org. You can find the actual text of this treaty mm -hmm. and see, uh, and then, and then uh, you can uh, understand it's a contract between these countries mm -hmm. and we're well, trying to make nuclear weapons an anathema is one of the things. Like we've made chemical weapons an anathema. 
So that's a hope is, is that even though the nuclear weapons states haven't uh, signed it, uh, that nevertheless people will look down on them for having it, having them. Yeah, Cheryl, I want to amplify something you said. I think equally important to remember that while so far the nations have signed it are less than a fifth of, of people, that'll change when big countries like Brazil and Indonesia sign. But of the countries under I mean, India and China, of course, with their vast populations, if you survey people in those countries, China, I don't have the data on, but certainly India, most people want to get rid of nuclear weapons. And, right. and so it's, it's the governments you're going against. It's not really going against the will of the people to, to join this treaty. Well, I mean, and I think right. it should pointed out, be pointed out that um, Africa, the nations in Africa, they signed some sort of uh, anti-nuclear treaty or- um, Nuclear uh, free zone. Not, not to um, promote nuclear weapons and Latin America also, isn't that true, John? Nuclear free zones, they're actually nuclear free zones, yeah. Large nuclear yeah. free zones. Large part of the Pacific, all of most of Africa and most of the Caribbean and South America. We really need one in the Near East, of course, but that's gonna to be tough well, with- People the, are working on that. So the, just another interesting fact, uh, I, I read the BBC News website every day and every five minutes <laughs> today. <laughs> so he was impeached, by the way, if you've all missed it, it's done, he's impeached. Um, 10 bishops in the UK issued a statement the other day saying that, in, that nuclear weapons are terrible and Britain should sign the TPNW mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. So uh, religious groups are very much against them. And, you know, we, we appreciate uh, their efforts. And, and the Pope, the Pope has spoken out against them totally. And the Trident submarines that the um, the plowshares people were active against, which we also, uh, several of them are also in, in Washington state, but they're in, it was, they were created in, con, um, in collaboration with England and they are in Scotland. And now with Brexit, <laughs> Scotland is, is, is like, they may just go on their own and they hate the, the Trident submarine. In fact, one of the activists, uh, Tim Wallace, who did a wonderful webinar a few weeks ago, uh, has grown, spent years there and has studied it and uh, written a book about it and is very um, hopeful that uh, Scotland will just say, we don't want these weapons anymore. Yeah, Scotland voted to stay in the EU when you when you divided the votes out and looked demo, you know by by region how different parts of Britain voted Scotland actually didn't want to leave and, and they may you know there's a threat that they will leave Britain in yeah. order to go back into the EU yeah yeah and this treaty may well play a part in that mm. this treaty? treaty this treaty may well play a part in that equation right yeah so again, the simplest things I, I think to do is 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 to write to your your Congress people. Catherine Bach, I don't know if Catherine, you're still listening over there, but uh, she's familiar with lobbying our our Congress people through the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which agrees with all this, and and uh, getting a hold of these guys and saying you know, these two things right off the bat: rejoin that New Start Treaty. That's the single most important thing. Work out the Iran thing. The Iran thing was sounded like it was going to be a no brainer also until Trump assassinated one of their major scientists. And now the people in Iran are so furious about that they may not want to get in this treaty. And, and then this back from the brink resolutions, you know, should we try to get that through the state legislature? And how do you do that in a time when they're so preoccupied with COVID? Mm. But the thing is to keep bringing it up every time you can. No. Right, so there's this big effort for next Friday, the 22nd, because that's the day it becomes uh, in force for in those 51 countries who've ratified it. But of course, it's an ongoing process. 
So we have to keep it in the public uh, view. And Nancy Pelosi talking about the nuclear button, that was marvelous <laughs> for, for ra raising the issue in, in the general public's mind. And, and we're trying to, you know, I'm tweeting about that. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to get uh, the public, uh, you know, to keep, keep some focus on that. Yeah, well, and we haven't mentioned the banks. I mean, that could be another um, focus is that the, um, the investments that banks have made in nuclear industries. And we, uh, some of us met with a woman from Code Pink uh, to look uh, on the state level and the um, pension, fund pension there. plans that have are developed. And of course, then there's the dichotomy that if, for example, the teachers uh, union and their uh, statewide um, uh, pension fund, they might, you know, they have to be argued, they have to be ca cajoled to see that this is an important thing to do because they might feel that they are, uh, will lose money if they divest from these nuclear industries. But John, you've, you've researched that and that usually it hasn't happened. Yeah, what little data there is that I haven't seen personally been, been told by people working on this for a while is that, that you, the fear that, that people will lose money if they divest from these certain things isn't, isn't borne out at all. People, if you look at weapons companies, they actually haven't done any better than the general market, surprisingly. Yeah, good. So are there any anyone else who wants to have something to say? Sandy Baird, um, you often have comments. Say is that I noticed when I was teaching school that most of my students never knew that the United States had been the first ever to use nuclear weapons. And I think it's important to understand that, that, that we all should understand the United States will never give up uh, the, this idea of first response because the United States also has done that already. The United States is the only nation that has used nuclear weapons in a war, right? It, it, what's always amazed me about that, it wasn't because they were desperately about to lose them. They had I already know. won the war and still used them. I yeah, I know. But thank you very much, John. That was very interesting. And thank you, Robin, for organizing it and Beth for recording it. Yes. So I'm going to have to leave now, too, but yeah. thank you. Thanks, Robin. Me too. Well, best wishes to everybody. Don't hesitate to contact Robin or I. And um, yeah. let me just throw my uh, oh, chat disabled. I was going to put my email in there, but Robin knows how to get in touch with me if anybody wants to get in touch with. Uh, Thank you. Good yeah, night. Yeah. Okay. All right. Blessings, yes. everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Beth. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, and everybody. Bye bye.